14th of May, the anniversary of the birth of Israel 70 years ago. Now, the Jews themselves, in their own calendar, celebrated that last month, but in the Western calendar, tomorrow is their 70th birthday. And that really is a remarkable event. Here's the newspaper from 70 years ago, the Palestine Post. The State of Israel is born. An amazing event in biblical history, biblical prophecy, an amazing event in world history itself. The State of Israel is born. In fact, the, the celebrations themselves were uh, quite remarkable, full of uh, zest, full of rejoicing, but it was also a time of celebration and reflection. Uh, a number of people began to pull apart Israeli society and examine what's happened in the last 70 years. And Israel's not without its problems. Uh, certainly it, it has a remarkable economy, known as a start-up nation. It has a, a tremendous sense of military presence. It's known upon the world stage for its revolutionary inventions, but it is still ridden, riven with division. Orthodox versus secular, a rich versus poor. It's a time of reflection as well as celebration. And the Jewish people themselves, who love to debate and to argue, have pulled apart their society and examined the intricacies of what makes up Jewish life today. This is an interesting reflection by a, a magazine which is called the Australian Israel Review. It comes out monthly and it looks at Jewish history as far as the Middle East is concerned. And, and their headline was, An Unlikely Story. Now, they're not prepared to say it's a miracle, but they are prepared to say it's an unlikely story. Israel at 70, a special edition. And the, the magazine went on to say, 70 years on, Israel remains a work in progress, but what already exists is an inspiration. Given Israel's impressive achievements, its determination to continue to prevail against all its adversaries, showing the same ingenuity and courage that has characterised its remarkable 70 years, so it will not falter. Very, very confident words. It's a nation living confidently. It's a nation that is really enamoured by its own success and progress. Not a miracle, but an unlikely story. Uh, but we're going to find out this evening that it is indeed a miracle, a biblical miracle. And the prophets of old have indeed prophesied of this tremendous event that happened some 70 years ago. It, 70 years ago, in 1948... The Jewish population was just a several hundred thousand people. They are now nearly nine million. They have absorbed a tremendous amount of immigra immigrants from various countries around the world. They have grown rapidly. And the estimate is by their 100th anniversary, the population will be over 15 million. Now, we've recently come back from the land of Israel. And I think they're going to run out of room if, if time went on. The land is populated. On every hill is a settlement. The towns are increasing rapidly. The infrastructure is dynamic and modern. Nine million people in that small land is indeed an amazing achievement from several hundred thousand. The magazine also looked at, at Israel's 70th year of achievement from a strategic assessment. And the comment was very simple. In short, Israel has become stronger, while its enemies, with the exception of Iran, have become increasingly weaker. The day after they declared independence in 1948, they were at war. The Arab armies, outnumbering them at least three to one, were defeated a short while after independence. In 1967, in the lightning six-day war, the Jews doubled their holdings in the land and took Jerusalem, their eternal capital. In 1973, they were invaded by Syria and by Egypt and managed to hold these nations at bay. Every single one of those was an existential threat to the nation of Israel. But they survived against all odds. And we believe that is highly significant from a biblical perspective, as we shall see. 
It's known as the startup nation. Innovation is part of the entrepreneurship of the Jewish people. Scattered throughout the land are many, many innovative companies that are striking out in a technology branch in amazing ways. Just off the coast of Israel too, they have discovered natural gas, large deposits which are now being, as we speak, brought on stream and being sold into Europe as the economy of Israel booms in so many ways. This was a country that 70 years ago was not in existence and now is achieving incredible things. It's not just an unlikely story, it is a remarkable miracle. But Israel is not without its problems. Tomorrow, Donald Trump is going to move the United States Embassy to Jerusalem. He promised in his campaign to move the embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people and he's going to do that. And that's causing great anxiety amongst some members of the international community. An unpopular move. And really from a Jewish perspective, Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, and Donald Trump are the firmest of friends. We have the best relationship right now with Israel that we've ever had, said President Trump. And these two, hand in hand, are making great strides to promoting Israel's popularity amongst the world. But not everything is rosy in the Middle East. I don't know whether you saw President Netanyahu's presentation on the Iranian nuclear position. He did a PowerPoint presentation. Israel lied big time. That's a pretty impressive PowerPoint presentation when you think about that. Accusing a nation of lying. In fact, what they did was they managed to secrete out of the depths of Iranian intelligence half a ton of documentary evidence showing that Iran had been pursuing a nuclear agenda. Now how they did that, no one knows. The very heart of Iran, pulling out half a ton of documents, they had to leave many behind because the truck couldn't hold them. And they got these across the border. And it was an amazing coup. Project Ahmad, which was their nuclear program, was really not buried in the Iranian agreement. And in fact, this PowerPoint presentation and the information that the Israelis provided to the world was enough to change Donald Trump's viewpoint and he's now pulled the plug on the Iranian deal. Once again, the Middle East is in turmoil. But just recently, just a few days ago, the whole area of the Middle East was again on the brink of war. Several weeks ago, the Iranians launched a drone into Israeli airspace, and the Israeli drone was later, the Iranian drone was later on uh, seen to actually have had weapons in it. The Israelis shot it down. As a result, they sent missiles across the border, and they destroyed the factory where the drone was launched from, and killed some Iranian personnel. Two days ago, the Iranians responded with something like 20 missiles across the border. And Israel reacted swiftly, and as you can see there from the map, those little red stars are all the points where the Israelis hit the Iranians. All of that is escalating to a dangerous position. So the 70th year anniversary is a bittersweet event. Israel and Iran attacked each other in Syria. What is going on? And there's a photograph there of some of the missiles coming across Damascus. The potential for escalation is much greater now than before. And they pulled back, but they're on tenterhooks in relation to that arrangement. So the question is, why is Israel's 70th anniversary so significant? Why, why are we holding lectures on this? Well, the answer is very simple, because the establishment of Israel as a nation was predicted over 2,000 years ago and against all odds, more than just an unlikely story, it is a modern day miracle. What other nation in the world 
has been risen from the ashes of persecution, annihilation, anti-Semitism, and come back as a nation. Well, the Jewish people have. All because God said, that's precisely what I want to happen. If you have your Bibles there, I'd like you to come to Isaiah 43 as we introduce our subject from a biblical perspective. The evidence is overwhelming. And we're going to introduce our comments by, by asking why. Why the Jewish people? Why, why do they have a part in God's purpose? Well, in Isaiah 43, God says this about Israel. Verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. And my servant whom I've chosen. So, so, so initially we're told that God has chosen this people to be a witness as well as a servant. That ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord and beside me there is no saviour. I have declared and saved I have showed when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, said the Lord, that I am God. Now that's quite a remarkable piece of scripture because it tells us a number of things. Firstly, Israel is a witness to the existence of God. The fact that Israel is alive as a nation is evidence, says the prophet, that God is alive. I am God and there's no other beside me. And secondly, the reason why Israel is back in the land as a witness to God's existence, that you, the Jewish people, may know and believe me. At the moment, they don't. The nation is divided into secular and orthodox religious groups. Some believe in the God of Israel, but many in Israel themselves have no real affinity to religion. They, they have a historical background, they have a culture, but really are not much interested in God. And God says, you're there as my witness, a testimony that I exist, and one day you're going to know and believe me. The second thing we want to talk about is that one of the reasons why the Jewish people feature so largely in the purpose of God is that many, many years ago, God made promises to the father of the Jewish people, which involved Israel in the purpose of God. Back in Genesis chapter 12, we won't turn to it this evening because we have the quotation there on the screen. The Lord said to Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee. Curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now we have lectures and seminars on these very promises, so we're not going to talk about them in detail. But I've highlighted a section of there which talks about the promise that God made to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. So what we're seeing in the birth of the Jewish state 70 years ago is the embryo of what God is going to develop into the future. It's going to be an entirely different constitution that they have now, but there was the promise, I will make of thee a great nation. And that's why they feature so much in the purpose of God. Now just look at the statistics. On the left there is a very famous painting called The Wandering Jew. Because that's precisely how the world perceived the Jewish people. Ever wandering and never finding a home. And on the other side of that screen are some statistics done recently in which it was estimated through polling and through a census that 1.09 billion people in the world today harbour anti-Semitic attitudes. That's a staggering figure when you think about it. And yet despite this, despite the fact they've been wandering for 2,000 years, persecuted, destroyed in some countries, the fact that there are over one billion people who have anti-Semitic attitudes, these people are back. And they're back in a very strong way. Some people say that God has finished with Israel. Just look at these words that Paul said. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Has he rejected them? 
Has he no interest in them? Isn't he going to fulfill the promise to Abraham? And Paul's answer was very blunt and very clear. God forbid. Israel has a part in the purpose of God. A large part in the purpose of God. And the restoration of Israel has been told categorically in the Bible. Predicted, written in the clearest terms, in the simplest prophecies. And tonight, we're going to give you eight particular quotations that demonstrate quite clearly that the Jewish people, in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus, they have no belief that Jesus is the Christ. And they will return to their land. God's purpose with the Jewish people has a number of phases. And the phase that we are seeing now, I'm going to call phase one, because these eight quotations all deal with predictions involving the Jewish people before their Messiah returns. The second phase is a massive transformation of this people that the Messiah of Israel will achieve. We're not going to talk about phase two in detail. We're just going to talk about phase one because this is the era that we're living in. Just think about it. eight clear predictions that the Jewish people are going to return in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the first one. Let's come to Ezekiel 38. We haven't got time to explore all the context of these passages and we would invite you to look at these later with us. Ezekiel 38, verse 8. After many days, says the prophet, thou, talking about Israel, thou shalt be visited. And that's interesting, isn't it? Visited. It's as though many, many years have passed when there's been no visitation. In the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that's brought back from the sword, is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now here's a picture here of some Jews on the sand dunes of Tel Aviv in the early 1900s. Those same sand dunes is now Tel Aviv today. The prophet said that this power in Ezekiel 38, which we believe to be Russia, but again we, we hold Bible lectures on this very chapter, this power would come against the nation of Israel that is gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel which have always been waste. And you see the sand dunes of Tel Aviv, always waste. That was the land of Israel over a hundred years ago. Waste and barren, denuded by the Ottoman Empire, never developed, always waste. They shall be brought out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And Israel today, nine million, of which about seven million are Jews, and the other two million are Arabs and others, dwelling confidently and safely in the land of Israel. It's their homeland. Now there's a prediction. But I want you to notice that verse, in the latter days. And that expression, latter days, is defined as the time when the Jewish people are back in their land safely. We are living in the latter days. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the end of his purpose is called the latter days. So not only is the return of the Jewish people predicted, but it's also telling us that the time frame of God's purpose is the latter years, the, the end of his purpose. In verses 11 and 12 of that chapter, this power will come against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Have gotten cattle and goods. So, so not only is the return of the Jewish people predicted in Ezekiel 38, 
But it's also telling us that there are, there are traders. Getting cattle and goods is a nation of entrepreneurs. There's wealth here. There's activity. There's trade. That's exactly what we see in Israel today. They definitely have gotten lots of assets and cattle and goods is part of their whole economy as they dwell in the midst of the land. So, so there's our first quotation. I'll bring them out of the nations, they shall dwell safely and they shall in fact get cattle and goods. Their economy will be all sufficient. Our second quote is in Joel chapter 3. Let's come across to the prophecy of Joel. One of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Joel chapter 3 and verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So what's that verse saying? Well, there's two things I want to draw to your attention. The first is this, that God says, I will bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So the Jewish nation, thrown out in AD 70 by the Romans and disenfranchised from their land and their capital city destroyed, went into captivity. And for 2,000 years, they have been a wandering, persecuted people, always subject, always in captivity. Now, God says in verse 1, I'm going to change that. I'm going to turn that captivity back. I'm going to reverse that captivity. And it's going to come into two stages. The first is Judah, and the second is Jerusalem. Now, in 1948, 70 years ago, the first part of that verse was fulfilled. God reversed the captivity of Judah. And the Jews in the land established their capital, established their nation. In 1948, Ben-Gurion stood up and read the Declaration of the Bill of Rights for Israel. But the second part of the verse was fulfilled in 1967. In 1967, the Israeli Defence Forces took the city of Jerusalem and the captivity of Jerusalem was reversed because until 1967, the Jews had very little part of Jerusalem. In fact, they lost it in the War of Independence in 1948. Judah first, then Jerusalem. Isn't that an amazing prophecy? And the next verse of Joel says that when you see that happen, in verse 2, I'm going to bring all nations against Jerusalem to battle. That's phase 2. That's another part of the purpose of God in Israel. I will turn back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. We've seen that before our very eyes. Here's the third quote in Jeremiah chapter 30. Let's come to this one, shall we? The prophet Jeremiah. Verse 3. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I have given to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And those are very clear words. There's a picture there on the left hand side of the very early settlers in the first Aliyahs in the late 1800s. Small, struggling families coming out of Russia and out of Central Europe. And they came back to drain the swamps. Very small numbers. And then World War II took place. And after that, the Jews came pouring back into the land. Verse 3 said, I will bring again the captivity. Now, that's the same language as Joel chapter 3. I will reverse the captivity of Israel and Judah. I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers. That's Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. 
and they shall possess it. They shall possess it, and they have. And they've come back, and God has reversed that captivity, just as he said. Now, verse 7 says there's a day of trouble coming. It, it started in verse 7, the day of Jacob's trouble. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, that's the phase two that we're talking about. There is coming a catastrophe in the Middle East, which is going to humble the Jewish people. And it started in that verse, the time of Jacob's trouble. But in the end, in the end, God will save them out of it. They will go through enormous problems, but God will save them. Let's come across to verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. And if ever we could summarise the way God has dealt with the Jewish people in the last 2,000 years, particularly through the horrors of Holocaust in World War II, it's that verse. I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Their iniquities and their sins and their hardness of heart from the crucifixion of their Messiah in AD 70 all the way through their unbelief to today has been a correction in measure. And the purpose of that is to change this people, to save them. And the promise is, is that God will make a full end of all nations. Nations come and go, but the Jewish people will always be there. I will not make a full end of you. And that's why they survived the War of Independence. That's why they survived the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War. Because they are the people of God, and God has a purpose in them. I'll bring you back to your land, and not leave you altogether unpunished. Our fourth quotation is Ezekiel 37. This was the reading that we had this evening. A dramatic chapter. Now Ezekiel 37 describes a graveyard. An extensive graveyard. And this extensive graveyard is described for us in the first two verses. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry. So the prophet is taken in spirit, in vision, placed in this massive valley full of bones. And he's caused to go around the perimeter. All the way around the perimeter and examine these bones. There were very many and very dry. So what do these bones represent? Well, we are given the interpretation in verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So the interpretation is clear. We're not making it up. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off for our parts. So it represents the Jewish people who scattered across the world believe that there is no hope. Always persecuted, always downtrodden, always wandering, never with a homeland. There is no hope in us. And God says, I'm going to change that. The whole house is going to be affected by my word and by my power. How do they become dead? Well, the whole of Israel has been politically slain and politically dismembered and scattered through the world. But God is going to reverse that. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. 
and I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So, so, so the purpose of this national resurrection is that Israel may know God. At the moment, they don't know God. But God's purpose is to give life to these people that eventually they may know him. So God says, I'm going to firstly put breath in you. Across the verse 26 of chapter 36. Then the heathen that are left round about shall know that I am the Lord, build the ruined places and plant them that were desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put in you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So, so the resurrection of Israel from this valley of dry bones is to give them life, but, but not just to give them life to live, but verse 26, a new heart and a new spirit to transform these people. That's the purpose of this resurrection, to change them. And that's part of the purpose of God. So in verse 7 of Ezekiel 37, I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prophesied and there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. So there was a noise. Now this word in the Hebrew, is more than just a noise, it's, it's used of a voice. So you picture the scene of, of this massive valley, all of these bones absolutely bleached, dead, dry. And all of a sudden, a voice, a proclamation goes out, and the whole of the valley starts to shake. An earthquake grips, and as it's shaking, all the bones click, 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 click into place. Bone to his bone. An amazing thing, absolutely astounding thing. And it all started with a voice, a proclamation. There, there, there was a, a signal given. And these bones began to come together. Uh, the word shaking there is, is this idea of an earthquake. A noise and a shaking. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what happened with the establishment and the revival and the breathing into life of the Jewish people did. A noise and a proclamation. You see, because in 1948, a proclamation was made to the world that the Jewish state is alive. That earthquake had a, a tremendous effect upon the region, the Middle East, and in fact the world, as it came to life. A noise and a shaking as this people came together. And God says, here's the interpretation. Here's the interpretation. It's not just the bones clicking together. Miraculous though that is, the interpretation is in verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This is not just the revival of the Jewish people. This is the revival of the Jewish people and the bringing of them back into their land. That's astounding. Two and a half thousand years ago, a prediction in graphic language of the political body of Israel re-established. And the interesting thing is, is that, that as Ezekiel's standing in this valley and, and the, the whole proclamation's being made and, and the whole valley is shaking, a wind comes sweeping across the valley from the four corners of the earth and gives life to these people because, you see, the Jewish people came from the four corners of the globe. They've been dispersed throughout the world. 
And the wind brought them back from all the four corners of the earth. Isn't that interesting? And the sinews came. And the flesh came. And there was life. What a miracle that is. What a miracle. More than just a remarkable story. It's a miracle. And God said, I will do that. But what is interesting about Ezekiel 37 is, is that at the end of verse 8, God says that, that even though they're up and alive, at the moment there's no breath in them. You, you, you see, they are still devoid of understanding the will of God. That will change in phase two. But in phase one, they're back in the land, they're alive politically, but there's no real power of God in them. No breath yet. That's coming in phase two. Now, just in case we miss the point of the political resurrection of Israel, in the same chapter that we read this evening, there was another vision given of two sticks clicking together. So, so, we, so we've changed the image from a valley of dry bones to two dry sticks clicking together. And those sticks coming together represented both nations, the Jewish people in dispersion and the Jewish people in the land, coming together as one nation. Now, now look at the language of verse 21. Here's the interpretation. Saying to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whither they be gone. I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Has that been fulfilled? Yes, it has. They have come back into their own land. Verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Have they become one nation? Yes, they have. Now look at the next clause of the verse. And one king shall be king to them all. Has that been fulfilled? No. That's phase two. Who is their king? That's Jesus Christ. That's the Messiah of Israel. So, so we, we are standing where that semicolon is in that verse. We've seen one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, semicolon, and one king should be king to them all. That's coming, and that's phase two. So, so we're in that verse. We, we historically are in that verse. What an amazing prophecy. Luke 21, so, so Jesus Christ himself made a prediction about the restoration of the Jewish people. Let's come to Luke 21. You see, as Christadelphians, we believe that both Old and New Testament are in absolute harmony. And the message of both Testaments is in fact identical. The Lord Jesus Christ, as King of the Jews, spoke about the restoration of the Jewish people. Let's read verse 24 of Luke 21. And they, that is the Jewish people, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Now that happened in AD 70. The Romans destroyed the Jewish state. They sacked Jerusalem. And the Jewish people were led away captive into all nations. There's that word captive again. We've come across that word before. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So, so let's just ponder that verse for a moment. The Romans swept through that city, burnt it to the ground, forced the Jewish people into captivity, but Jesus Christ used a little word there, until. So there's a limit placed upon the exile of Jerusalem in relation to the Jewish people. It'll be trodden down until. And in 1967, that little word, until, was fulfilled. The Jewish people took Jerusalem. Now, Jesus Christ, knowing the prophets of Israel, understanding the restoration of the Jewish people, made that same prediction. That Jerusalem would one day return to the Jewish people. And we've seen that in our lifetime. Our next quotation is just a few verses later on. 
Verse 29, he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now night hand. So he's using an agricultural figure of speech. Take a look at fig trees, one particular fig tree, and all other trees, but particularly the fig tree. And when that shoots forth, you know that summer's coming. Spring's here, summer's coming. Now look at verse 31. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is night hand. So let's just examine this carefully. Behold the fig tree. Now, in Hosea chapter 9 and verse 10, and Joel chapter 1 verse 7, the fig tree is a symbol of the Jewish people. That fig tree has been dormant, as it were, for 2,000 years. All of a sudden, it starts to shoot forth. It's alive. It's alive. And the fig tree of Israel was given life 70 years ago when the nation of Israel was established. When you see these things come to pass, I want you to understand, said Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is near at hand. What does that mean? It means, ladies and gentlemen, that phase two is very nearly about to start. And phase two involves the return of Jesus Christ, the transformation of the Jewish people spiritually, the humbling of the Jewish people, and the establishment in Israel of the capital of the world, the kingdom of God in nucleus. Now that kingdom, run by Jesus Christ and his saints, will in fact permeate across the globe and transform the world. So what we're seeing is not just the return of the Jewish people, incredible though that is, not just a nation come back from the dead, incredible though that is, we are seeing it as a sign God is alive and is about to bring phase two, the establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth. That's why it's such a miracle. And that's why this anniversary to us as Christadelphians is highly significant. The kingdom of God is nearly here. And we believe that with all our hearts. In Jeremiah chapter 16, we have another prophecy about the return of the Jewish people. And this specifically talks about the way in which they would, in fact, return to their land. Uh, let's read Jeremiah chapter 16, uh, and let's read from verse 14. Therefore, behold, the, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought out the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, from all the lands whither he has driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Now, now look, at, look at the accuracy of this. God is going to bring the Jewish people back from the land of the north and all lands. Now, the land of the north, uh, geographically from Israel, is Central Europe. Russia. And the first waves of immigrants back to the land of Israel came precisely from that region of the globe. The first Zionists were nearly all from Germany and Poland and Ukraine, Lithuania and southern Russia. Isn't that interesting? The land of the north is given the geographic existence and all lands, but predominantly the land of the north. And there we have some photographs of pictures of those early Jews from Russia and Eastern Europe coming back to the land, a significant contribution to the return of the Jewish people. That's exceedingly accurate, the land of the north. And how will they get back? Well, in verse 16, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish for them. Now, now a fisherman throws a net out, doesn't he, and, and tries to capture the fish and to, to bring them back to shore. Be fishers. 
capturing their imagination, capturing them in, in, the, in the net of the message. And that's exactly what happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as, as those people began to formulate a policy called Zionism, political Zionism. There was no religious connotation with this, but it was a political movement started by a man called Theodore Herzl. This man here is Ben Yehuda, who introduced the Hebrew language back into circulation. And he argued that if we're coming from all nations, we need a common language. Let's go back to Hebrew. It's our traditional language. Heim Weizmann, who was a very powerful political figure in Europe itself, particularly Britain, and, and Zionism had some effect. As the net went out and brought some Jews back, it, it had some effect. But God says, I'm going to, in verse 16, introduce the hunters. I'm going to drive them back into the land. And the hunters came in the gruesome form of persecution and holocaust. You know, even the language of books written on the subject, hunting down the Jews, hunt for the Jews, Hitler's furies, German women in the Nazi killing fields. These were the very real hunters that pushed them back. Six million Jews perished in the concentration camps of Europe. As God hunted them back. A tragedy that brought them back home, just as the prophet said. See, verse 18 says, and first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. Many Jews lost their faith coming through the Holocaust. Their faith in the existence of God, that the, that the God of Israel could possibly allow such devastation and suffering to occur. But there's a bigger purpose here. As he pushed them back to the land against their will. And our final quotation, the final of the eighth, is in Isaiah chapter 11. An amazing prophecy concerning the return of the Jewish people in our time. Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush and from Elam, from Shina, from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. Now, here's the point of the prophecy. That expression there, I will set my hand again the second time, is still a future event. But the implication is that there was a first time. See that? I'm, I'm going to do this a second time and I'm going to bring my people back from all these people. That's phase two. But the implication quite clearly is that there was in fact a first time that he set his hand to bring the people back. And the nations themselves are outlined in very specific detail. Assyria, which is the area of Syria today. Egypt and Pathros. Pathros is part of southern Egypt. Cush, that's the area of Ethiopia and Sudan. Elam is the area of Iran. Shina is the area of Iraq. And Hamath is the area of Lebanon. That's quite specific, isn't it? Now this map here demonstrates exactly what happened 70 years ago. Those numbers there on the map represent the number of Jews who were living in all of those countries the first time which came back to the land of Israel. And the remarkable thing is, is that Jewish communities had lived in Syria and Iraq and Egypt and Libya and Tunisia for thousands of years. And as soon as the Jewish state was established in 1948, the Arabs themselves put enormous pressure on the Jews living in their own countries. And thousands, the numbers are incredible, left those Arab countries under duress and came back to the land of Israel the first time. Isn't that an amazing prophecy? So when you put all those eight quotations together, 
It demonstrates the truth of the Lord's words in John 17, that God's word is truth. We can have absolute, absolute confidence in this book. And those eight predictions, so clear, so obvious, so relevant, have been powerfully fulfilled in the establishment of the Jewish state and the return of the Jewish people. We've seen that with our own eyes. Tomorrow is the anniversary. So the question that we need to ask ourselves, the, the, the takeaway message that we need to ask ourselves is, well, what's coming next? And the answer is in that quotation in Luke 21, that when you see these things come to pass, and we have seen them graphically fulfilled, miraculously, against all odds, then know ye that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Now, there couldn't be any clearer language than that. It's just round the corner. And the next phase of God's purpose is to send his son back to this earth, to transform the Jewish people, to punish the wicked, and to establish the kingdom of God. And the wonderful thing about the Bible is, is that it's offering us all a place in that kingdom. It's given us the evidence. You are my witnesses said God to the Jewish people that I am God and I will save you. The testimony and evidence is there across those eight quotations. God's word is absolutely true. So the question is, are we going to be part of this next phase? It's coming whether we're ready or not. It's coming whether we like it or not. Uh, Christ is warning us that it's coming. We need to do something about that. To examine this book to understand the power of his message, to change our lives, to be baptised into Jesus Christ, to live a faithful life. That when the kingdom of God comes and the Messiah of Israel is here in the earth, we can find a place with him to transform this world too, to change it from its evil and its ungodliness into the wonder and glory of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Israel is God's witnesses, the kingdom of God, is nigh at hand. Experiencing a dramatic renaissance never before seen in human history. In a land that was barren for nearly 2,000 years, life is bursting forth. Acres of vineyards and olive groves are transforming rocky mountains. From every nation on earth, Christian tourists are coming here by the millions, fulfilling their dreams of walking in the very places where their Saviour walked. And most miraculously of all, Israel is once again becoming the home of the once scattered Jewish people. Over the last century they have returned here by the millions, from the north, south, east and west. We are living in the times spoken about long ago, the time that this nation would be reborn. Herzl realized that the only solution to anti-Semitism was for the Jews to have their own state.
By 1914, there were nearly 100,000 Jews living in Palestine. They had started 50 agricultural villages and farmed roughly 100,000 acres of land. His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. After the American, British, and Allied forces defeated the Germans, hundreds of thousands of Jews came to Palestine, and the UN General Assembly passed a fateful plan to divide up Palestine into independent Arab and Jewish states. As the roll call began, proceedings were momentarily interrupted. A piercing cry came from the gallery, Anna Adonai Hoshi Anna, O Lord, please save us. The United States? Yes? Yemen? No? The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. The stage was set. On the afternoon of May 14th, several council members met to approve the final draft of the declaration. The text was approved unanimously, but just hours before it would be read, the new state still didn't have a name. Historical names like Zion and Judea were proposed and rejected. It was Ben-Gurion who decided that the name would be simply Medinat Israel, the State of Israel. Despite the instructions for secrecy, the news had leaked out and a large crowd gathered outside the museum. Jewish leaders were now racing the sunset to finish the ceremony before the Sabbath began at 5 o'clock. At 4 p.m., David Ben-Gurion called the meeting to order. The crowd rose and sang Hatikva. Then, Ben-Gurion read the declaration aloud. President Truman recognized the new state of Israel just 11 minutes after the British mandate officially ended. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. He was cheering in the streets, it was a big thing, dancing in the streets and all this, and he was standing in the back there. He says, what the people are dancing here, what they don't know, is tomorrow we've got a war. It wasn't long before Ben-Gurion was proven right. In the Declaration of Independence, he had offered the Arabs an equal place in the new state. But that night, his olive branch was answered by the roar of Egyptian warplanes. At one minute past midnight, they bombed the city of Tel Aviv. And at dawn, 
Tanks from five Arab armies rolled into the new state of Israel. A year later, in 1949, all sides had grown weary of fighting. Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria signed armistice agreements with Israel. The Jewish state had survived the first of many challenges to her existence. At a meeting ending in the early hours of the morning, Defense Minister Diane told the cabinet that only through a preemptive strike could Israel stand up to the Arab armies now massed along its borders. That strike, he added, must take place sooner rather than later. He then laid out the battle plan devised by the country's top military minds. The attack order was radioed from the Defense Ministry in Tel Aviv. Israeli planes took off at staggered intervals, heading for key Egyptian bases in the Sinai, the Suez, and Nile Valley. In just seven minutes, the Israeli Air Force destroyed the Egyptian planes before moving on to rocket bomb enemy airfields. From the Temple Mount, the paratroopers sprinted to the western wall to clear it of snipers. There were serious casualties, but in minutes the battle was over. For the first time in 2,000 years, the old city of Jerusalem was in Jewish hands. And for many, it was a moment that was almost impossible to fathom. Israel becomes increasingly in the world, there will be those who stand up for Israel with the faith and integrity of Abraham, and they will make all the difference. Israel was founded three years after the Holocaust. Three years after 70% of the Jews were destroyed in what is exponentially the largest slaughter of any people in human history, the remnant trickle back against the will of the British, okay, with no support from the world, into a desert piece of real estate with no natural resources, no infrastructure, surrounded by millions of hostile Arabs in a constant state of warfare, terrorism, economic blockade. And think about it, within a few years, the desert is exporting fruits and vegetables to the rest of the world. But Israel is the only country in the world that has more trees at the end of the 20th century in the beginning. In terms of high tech per capita, the most in the world is in Israel. Done in less than 40 years, with no natural resources, constant war, terrorism, economic blockade. It's unbelievable. But people just don't see it because we've gotten used to it. It's Jewish history. It's all supernatural. I think I'm privileged to have grown up in a land where my grandfather, where his parents, where his forefathers only dreamed of living one day, of seeing built one day. This is home, and home is where you want to be.